Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with legendary custom knife maker, Peter Carey. Peter has been making spectacular and unique tactical and dress tactical folders since the very early days of the form. He's done numerous collaborations with other makers and with production companies like Spider Co. and more recently Monterey Bay Knives, putting his gorgeous designs in reach for the everyday collector. In recent years, Peter has also put out his own production line, which I got a chance to check out at Blade Show a few weeks back. His designs vary, but I feel like I can always tell when I'm looking at a Peter Carey knife, which makes me very excited to talk to the man behind the blades. But before we get into it, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. While you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and other interviews with the great makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so by going to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. Peter, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. Oh, thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah. So a uh, couple of days back, uh, you gave me a call, which was a nice surprise. And we and we just chatted a little. And uh, I feel like I got to I got to know a little bit about you. Uh, and, and one of the things uh, that really fascinated with me, uh, fascinated me is that you were born and grew up in the golden age of <laughs> Southern California in the yeah. 60s and 70s. And um, yeah, I have, I have a real romantic notion about that time and place. Um, so tell me about how you got involved in in knife making. And did it start there? Uh, yeah, in in Southern California. You know, just like everybody else, um, you know, knife makers. We love knives as kids, right? So um, I collected knives. Um, my my older brother was a real influence on me, uh, Richard. Um, you know, we were allowed to carry knives back then in school, right? So. I carried a little knife. Um, in fact, I still have it. A little uh, case sod buster. I can't believe I still have this thing from junior high. Right? My brother gave me that in junior high. And, um, you know, so he kind of got me hooked on knives. My, my dad wasn't really into knives, but I remember he had a bayonet from World War II uh, in the garage. And it was like, wow, this thing is just cool you know yeah um but it was more my my brother that got me into into knives than anything else so was he uh was your brother an influence in terms of using them or was he a collector like what what was your what was the lifestyle like then that you were carrying knives at school i, I can't even imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> everybody carried knives back then you know um in, in the 60s and the 70s, it was it was normal for a kid to have a knife in his pocket. It wasn't wasn't any big deal. I mean, we were about an hour um, east of L.A., kind of out in the country. You know, it was all uh, orange groves, citrus groves and, and vineyards and um, kids just had knives. And my brother always carried a knife. Um, you know, he was he was a Vietnam vet and he came back and, and he always had a, uh, a Puma, um, a Puma folding knife like the like the Buck 110. Right. Um, I think it was called a game master or something. Um, but he, he always had one of those in his back pocket and he would actually take those because he thought they were too thick and, and he would grind the handles down. Right. And the bolster that had uh, brass bolsters, he would grind them way thinner than they came from the factory. And so I don't know if that influenced me that you, wow, you can take something and modify it. But, uh, you know, he did that to all his knives. Man, that's that's an interesting idea because I have uh, you know I have a buck one ten and a one twelve and I've always loved them, and always kind of regretted the fact that I never carry them because they are like boat anchors and you got to have them on your yeah in a yeah. in a sheath on your belt. Maybe that's a good idea. Just grind it down. Well, I never I never liked the the little leather sheath you know on your belt, so I always liked it in my pocket instead. But you know that wasn't really handy either. You know, in your back pocket. Um, this is another knife that my brother gave me. It's a, it's a Puma. 
can't remember what model it is, but uh, I used to carry this in my left back pocket, and um, it's it's really the first knife that I ever modified. Right? Wait, it's can not, you can you hold that back up? Let me yeah, see that. Yeah, it's not highly modified, but um, I was actually riding my motorcycle to work. I worked at a gas station in high school, and this old lady pulled out in front of me, and then saw me and stopped right blocking the road. So I laid my motorcycle over and, and slid around the front end of her. And I was, you know, riding on top of the motorcycle, laid over and sliding on my butt. Well, this knife, I was sliding on this knife <laughs> and, and it ripped a hole in my back pocket and the knife fell out and I didn't realize it till I got to work. Right. And so after work, it was dark. And so I, I was out there with a flashlight trying to find my knife on the road and I found it, but it was all scratched up and the little Puma emblem that, that went right in there. Um, you could see the little black yeah. circle. Um, it was gone. So, you know, I took some black crap and filled it up and then ground it and got rid of all the scratches and stuff. And so that was kind of, you know, the first knife that I modified. I figured if my brother could do it, I could do it too. Right. Jeez, man. Uh, looking at that knife um, and then looking at the knives uh, that you make today, you've, you've come quite a way. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just surprised that I still have these knives from that long ago you know obviously I, I cherished them because you know my brother gave them to me so it's I, also safe you know. to say that that <laughs> knife saved your butt quite literally yeah, it, did. It, it really did it really did um i've always had knives since since i was a kid you know and, and what really got me back into knives is i guess it was in the early 80s a uh, guy i worked with um another welder right um gave me a spider co worker and actually still have this thing if you look at the blade it's like all ground up because i used it for everything but this knife like totally changed everything for me you know sal glesser with the the pocket clip was the biggest thing you know i wasn't that impressed with the hole but the pocket clip right no longer did i have to keep it in my pocket or keep it in a sheath i could clip it to my pocket and it was like that was awesome right yeah, because there's that that feeling of having a, a knife free floating in your pocket. You get about maybe a minute or two with it with it uh, standing, you know, north to south, which is the comfortable position, and then you walk, and eventually it it rides, you know, yep. east yep. to west, and you're constantly readjusting that, and uh, and to have a clip is a, like a revelation. Yeah, it was it was it was mind blowing to me. You know, it's like a pocket clip. You know, because I always carried a, a measuring tape around with a clip on it. It's like it just made so much sense to have a knife with a clip on it, right? So you were a welder by trade from early yeah. on? Yeah, like right after high school, I, I, was, I, I went to college, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew I could weld because I welded in junior high and, and in high school and in shop classes. And I liked it because I got to burn stuff. And <laughs> um, I got in a lot of trouble in, in school and shop classes. And. I actually got kicked out of wood shop um, for setting the building on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a long story, but uh, me and another guy um, got in trouble for catching the building on fire. And, um, so Mr. Allman, um, the, the shop teacher for wood shop, permanently banned me from wood shop. So metal shop it was, right? Metal shop and welding <laughs> and all that. And, you know, I got in a lot of trouble in metal shop too, but they didn't kick me out. You know, we used to take the little, uh, we used to do brazing and they had the little container with flux in it. Oh. And so instead of opening the whole lid, they, they drill a hole in it. So you could just dip the rod in there, heat the rod, dip it in the, in the flux. Right. Well, we know what it is looking. I take the oxygen selling torch and put a little oxygen selling in that hole. And the next guy that put that rod, hot rod in it, it would blow up. Right. <laughs> and the lid would hit it. And I'd just be looking around. Like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it, but. Yeah, luckily I didn't get kicked out of metal shop because that's what I decided to do, you know, after high school. It's like, well, I don't know what I want to do, but I can weld. I need to make some money. So I got certified as a welder and, and started working in a, in a steel fab shop, uh, fabricating structural steel. So I did that for, man, six years before I started my own company. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you were telling me that and you uh, would go into uh, already existing structures and shore them up for earthquakes and that kind of thing? Um, we did everything. I mean, we did we did brand new construction of uh, you know businesses, uh, custom houses, 
um, aircraft control towers, um, bridges. We, we rebuilt the, uh, like after that Northridge earthquake, we did a lot of the work on um, retrofitting the, the columns that hold those bridges up. The, the columns were made out of concrete with re rebar in them. Hmm. And what we were doing was wrapping them in steel. And, and so they'd come in two halves and, you know, they, they'd wrap them and we'd do full pin welds on both sides all the way up. And some of those things were, you know, 80 foot tall. So it was pretty good work. It sounds like the, the concrete column itself could eventually fall away, but it'd still stand because of that, uh, that outer it's structure. Still, yeah. So yeah. how did, how did this, was it the welding that led you? I mean, you already had a love of knives, well-established inspired by your brother and the bayonet in the, in the garage. <laughs> did, did the working with metal and welding did, how did it come about that you started to make these fine knives? Well, you know, again, being totally interested in knives and guns and stuff. Um, when, when my jobs would get rained out or whatever on the way home, I I'd, I'd stop by the, uh, um, the gun shop, right. And talk to the guys and look at guns that I wanted to buy. And, um, they had a knife in there that was just like a blank, right. That you could buy and, and you can go finish it yourself. So, you know, my job was rained out. It was raining. I couldn't do anything. And so I, I bought one of those blanks and, and I took it home and, and I had some wood laying around and I made a handle for it and put it together. And I, I didn't make a sheath for it, but you know, I, I made this knife, right. I didn't have to grind it. It was already heat treated and everything. I just made a handle for it. And I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. But I want to go farther than that. I want to, I want to grind and actually make a knife. Right. But before I um, you know, bought all the tooling and everything, I already had a drill press. Um, I made this knife with a file. All right. Whoa. Check that thing out. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is actually the very first knife I made 100% on my own. Wow. With that a file. Is, that is <laughs> nice. It looks like a, like a sort of like a loveless dagger there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I kept that. I never made a sheath for it either. It was just like, huh. I took a lot of work, you know, files and sandpaper and, you know, all that stuff. So you um, didn't have a grinder at this point. You were just no, but after I did that, it was like, all right, I'm going to buy a grinder. And I'm going to buy, you know, the, the minimum stuff I needed to, to make a knife. So I, I started making, you know, small fixed blades. Um, on one of our vacations, I, I ended up getting a magazine at one of the stores and um, it had an article in there on these guys that made neck knives, right? Small mm -hmm. fixed blade neck knives. And um, one of the guys was Bud Neely, right? I don't know if you know who Bud Neely is. Oh, I sure do. He made some really cool small fixed blades. And it's like, man, I, I want to be able to do that. So when we got back, there was a knife show in Solvang, Solvang, California. And, and we drove up there and I bought my first custom knife from but newly nice right? <laughs> so i was like okay i can make one of these so you know i got all i've got all the equipment and, and um you know started making some fixed blades um here's a another this is a real early <laughs> i made this for my dad uh -huh. right oh, and, cool. and i and i just recently found it in my dad's um tackle box my dad passed away in 2006, right? So I, I got a bunch of his stuff and I was looking through his, his old tackle box and it's like, wow, here's this knife, right? <laughs> cool. I forgot, you know, forgot that I made it. You know, I, I, I went back then I was making knives and I was just giving them away to friends and, and, and contractors and, and just giving them away. I wasn't selling them. You know, I didn't think they were worth selling, right? So what, what year is this about? You, you, you uh, saw the Bud Neely's and you started making your, your own. I, I made this first one in 97. 97. So I, I made fixed blades from 97 to 2000, 2000. I made my first folder. Okay. So tell me, uh, <laughs> you know, describe or explain that transition. I, it seems like a daunting one to go from fixed blades, which, <laughs> which have no mechanism, no yeah. mechanical aspect to them to right. a folder. How did that happen and what inspired it? Well, this knife right here inspired it. And I don't know if you're familiar with this knife. It's a Spyderco, right? It's a collaboration with Mr. Terzola. Bob Terzola, right? So I, got, I bought this knife, right? And it's like, who's this guy, right? Who is this guy? Oh, he's a custom knife maker. 
Custom knife maker. Hmm. Custom folder maker. Like, all right, cool. So uh, then he came out with that book, the uh, the tactical folding knife. All right, and I bought that book, and it was like it had all the answers I needed to to make a folder, you know, with a with a liner lock. And so I started working on that and followed. I mean, my book. I got this book right. It's it's it's, it's all dirty and crap. But, um, <laughs> I followed everything that he said in that book on, on, on how to make a folder. And, and, you know, the first ones were pretty rough, but, uh, but it worked. So this right here is my, my first folder that I ever made. Right. It's kind of funky. Wow. Kind of trippy looking. That looks great, man. That was your, <laughs> that was your first folder. That's, so that's that, my first folder. Is that a frame lock? Uh, yeah, I guess you like would call a, it a frame lock with some overlays, titanium some okay. overlays. Yeah, I don't know if you can right. see it there very good. Yeah. But. Anyway, I gave it to a friend of mine that I worked with, and I told him to beat the crap out of it. You know, And, and he beat the crap out of it, and he, he brought it back a few months later, and it was all tore up. And So I gave him another knife, and, and I refinished that, and I gave it to my dad. And so my dad had it you know, until he passed away, and I, I got it back. So that's how you got it back. Uh, so it, did you – find yourself um like i i've i i tell people this sometimes just as a matter of uh reference but i have made a few knives in in the shed out back you know and they take me forever and they're fixed blades and they're you know they're cool as far as i'm concerned i send them to someone else to heat treat but they take yeah. me forever and to me it's challenging enough i mean i can't believe your first knife was a dagger to me that that blows my <laughs> mind because it's like you couldn't have picked a harder fixed blade yeah no, no kidding no so was was there a challenge there to go into the folders that really pulled you in um not really the challenge it was i just wanted to make folders i love folders you know i've been carrying folders since i was a kid right so that's really what i wanted you know, don't get me wrong. I like fixed blades, but um, folders was always my desire. So, I mean, that's really what I wanted to make. Well, then how, okay. So how did you go from these folders, like the, like the ones you've been carrying and using to these beautifully dressed up exotic material um, pieces? Uh, years and years of work, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, Originally, I didn't want to. I didn't want to work with any of those fancy materials. You know, you know, I told a lot of guys that you know. Some, there's some collectors that that know me from early on. That no, I didn't want to work with any of that. I wanted to make tactical folders that were users, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you know, eventually you got to do it, right? Eventually, somebody wants something fancy, and then then it's kind of a challenge. Okay, I got I got to try that. Right? I got to do it. So. And then, you know, once people see that and, and they like it, that's what they start ordering. You know, they start ordering the fancy stuff, not not only because they like it, but I think because they can sell it for more down the road. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I had I, when, when I first started taking orders, um, I worked part time. I mean, it was just basically a hobby until I moved out here to Texas. Right. I started selling a few knives in 2000. We moved out here in 2006. But I wasn't really trying to make any money, you know, when I was in California. Um, it was just a hobby when I had time to do it. And if I could make a few bucks, um, I'd do it. My, my first folder that I sold was to my mechanic, right, who, who fixed my trucks, you know, every time they broke down. So he was like my first, my first customer to buy a folder. Um, so so those, uh, those first folders that were usable and, and – uh, and and sturdy i mean not that the other ones aren't sturdy but to me like the your more artsy artful exotic material folders look like things that i wouldn't want to test to see how sturdy they are obviously you're 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 making them in the same you know it's it's the same guy making them right yeah and they're they're still built strong you know the, the materials you know well you know like timascus it's fancy but it's not fragile it's it's a tough material it's titanium Right. I mean, it's tough stuff. So really the only, you know, fragile materials are like, you know, mammoth ivory and, and, and stuff like that. Right. Um, Damascus, it's, it's tough material, you know? So, I mean, you can beat the crap out of it. It's just going to cost you a lot of money to get it refinished. Right. <laughs> it's just going to look yeah. good doing it. Yeah. I don't refinish knives for free anymore. 
you know, I, I used to do that as a service, but people would take advantage of it. And, um, you know, they'd, they'd carry him and show him off and beat the crap out of him. They send him back to you and, and you, you spend hours, you know, cleaning them back up and send them back to him. And next thing you know, it's for sale <laughs> right? and, and for a lot of money, you know, right. more money than you sold it for. And you're not getting anything for, you know, refurbing it. So I started charging to do refurbs. So how did you break into, um, how did you, what was the knife and, and tell me what it was like when you became sort of known for making these kind of pieces? Um, the nitro, the full size nitro, um, here's a 50, 50 nitro, but this knife right here, um, mm. before it was a flipper, when it was just a thumb stud knife, um, this is the knife that really got me off the ground. Um, when I first moved to Texas, I, I set up my shop and screwed off a lot because um, I was just so burnt out from being a contractor for you know 20 something years. Um, I spent a lot of time fishing and golfing and hunting and shooting and you know just enjoying life while I slowly set up my shop. And I ended up making uh, three nitros and I put them on the USN, right? Way back, way back when, um, 2007, I think it was, 2006 maybe. And um, this guy um, hits me up and he goes, well, I want to buy one, but I don't know which one I want. Cause they all had, all three of them had different handle material. Right. And um, I go, all right, that sounds good. Get back to me when you make up your mind. Right. Well, he didn't get back to me for a day or so. And another guy, you know, calls me up and he goes, I want all three. <laughs> I'm like, all right, <laughs> you know, uh, sell all three right now. And so yeah. I, so I sold all three to this guy. I don't want to name names, but um, this other guy calls me up and he goes, okay, I, I made up my wine. I, I want this one. And I'm like, oh, it's already sold. He got pissed, right? <laughs> Snooze, and you so, lose. <laughs> and so we went back and forth and, and we ended up becoming really good friends. He's a, he's a good, he's a good friend of mine. He's a, he's a good collector and, and he'll know when he listens to this, <laughs> who, who he is. but he's a real good guy and he's got, he's got a pretty good collection of, of my knives, but. You know, it's, it's one of them things where, you know, it, it, it could have turned into an argument where you hate each other, but, you know, you work it out, right? So it was that nitro that really pushed you, pushed you. Is that, is that a four yeah. inch blade? About a four inch blade? Um, three and three quarters. So three just under four quarters. inch. Okay. Yeah. And so then I started getting orders. You know, my, my wife told me, she goes, well, when we moved out to Texas, she goes, what are you going to do for a living? And I go, well, because we came out here with nothing, right? Um, no jobs lined up, not knowing anybody. I mean, we just sold everything in California and, and, and moved out here. And I told her that, you know, I, I want to try being a knife maker, you know, at, at, you know, to make a living at it. She goes, I give you two years to be successful. Right? <laughs> so, you know, the pressure is on. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, I took, uh, I took a year's worth of orders and I, and I gave people prices. I gave people dates, which is just crazy i realized right yeah, yeah. but this is the first time taking orders right before i would just make what i wanted and, and and sell it if somebody wanted to buy it so i struggled through that year and and i met those dates and and i met those prices even though you know as my popularity was going up you know obviously the prices needed to be going up and price of material were going up so i kept taking orders but i i stopped giving dates and prices because everybody was also changing their mind on what they wanted right mm -hmm. And so I took probably five, six, seven years worth of orders, which was just really stupid, honestly. <laughs> but I had to show my wife, right? I had to show Olivia that, look, I got all these orders. I got all this work lined up. I can right. do this. Right? I can make some money at this, right? So, so you had five or seven years uh, worth of orders. Did it take you five to seven years to go through those first ones? <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> Honestly, no, I, you know, I've, I've added, I've obviously added names um, since then. And I actually stopped taking orders. It got to the point where I had to stop taking orders, but I started doing shows. Right. Uh -huh. And I took those orders, not ever planning on doing shows. I didn't, I didn't want to do shows. You know, I, I didn't want to be that guy. Cause you know, I'd gone to knife shows before and mm -hmm. you see the guy sitting there and you know, nobody talks to him and nobody looks at his knives and, you feel sorry for the guy, right? And I did not want to be that guy. I was not going to be that guy. So I didn't want to do shows, right? And so there's a dealer, Mark Strauss, Strauss, you know, you know, Mark. Yeah. Um, so he, he was asking me, you know, hey, you want to do a show? And I'm like, no, I really don't want to do shows. He goes, what if I can get you into the TKI? 
And I'm thinking, yeah, right. TKI. Right. So, you know, I go, if you can get me into the TKI, I'll do the TKI. Next thing you know, he's got me lined up to do TKI. And, and I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm not ready for this because these are like the top guys, right? right. My first my first knife show as an exhibitor is going to be the TKI. And I'm like, man, I was stressed out. So that was that was in Vegas. That one when um, Ed Wormser still ran that show, and um, it was at the man. I can't the Palms. Right? I don't know if you're familiar with the Palms in Vegas, um, but it was at like the very top floor. And, and so we went up there, and and uh, I go in the room, and and there's you know can onions in there, and Bob Tur- Bob Terzola is in the table right beside me, and Yin's Anzo is on the other side, and I'm like. Man, I do not belong in this room. <laughs> right? I, I, I do not belong in this room. But, you know, Bob Terzola, right? Bob Terzola, right? Bob Terzola book. Bob Terzola is right beside me, right? So I walk over to Bob. I'm looking at his knives. I introduce myself. And you know, I'm like, he's going, well, let's go over and look at your knives. Right? Bob Terzola is going to look at my knives. <laughs> right? <laughs> So that, I mean that was just totally cool. He, he's he's just a gentleman. He comes over and he looks at all that and he goes, "Man, they're really nice. They're really well made." And so that took a little bit of pressure off, right? I, yeah. I didn't feel too it's too like bad, you, you, but you taught me well, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I was still I, I was I still felt like I didn't belong there, you know. But let me ask you a question. T- T- TKI is Tactical <clears throat> Knife Invitational, right? Yeah. So you so got to be invited. You have to, to be invited to that show. Okay. All right, that's interesting. So usually it's like, it used to be like 20 makers and then like 250 collectors. And that's it. Once once, once they got that room full with 250, there's no more, right? Wow. And limited limited makers. And so, you know, it's kind of kind of an exclusive deal. And, and, you know, they serve you drinks. They give you dinner. I mean, it's it's really a nice show. You know? It's the high it's, rollers you know, show. Yeah, it's it's in the evening and, and it's, it's always been, you know, one of my favorite shows, not because it was my first show, but it's just a really good, good way to do a knife show. You know, you don't got to sit there at it behind a table for two or three days, like, you know, blade show three days. Like, God, it's terrible. So it's, it's kind of assumed if you, if you're invited to TKI, there's a market for your work and there will most likely, there's obviously no guarantees, but there will most likely be buyers there for your work. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not so much of a, um, it seems like maybe it's not so much of a competitive thing because people who want a Bob Terzola are going to show up there to get a Bob Terzola. People who want a sure. Peter Carey are going to show up there to get a Peter yeah. Carey. And it's all it's all lottery. Every piece on everybody's table is lottery. You, you can't just go in there and go, I want to buy that. You got to be chosen the right to buy that, right? Or or open yeah. bids, right? So, you know, every, everything, everything sells pretty much at every TKI. I, I've never seen a TKI work. You know, anybody had knives left on the table. I wonder if they want someone like mm, myself to cover it sometime. That I mean, it's, sure. <laughs> it just sounds like a fascinating place to be a uh, a fly on the wall. You know, yeah. if you if you don't have uh, you know if you're not invited, it seems like it'd be a yeah. cool thing to to experience. Well, you can always buy a ticket. It's a few hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll 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 see about that. Maybe a couple of years from now. Maybe a couple yeah. of years from now. So uh, you go to your first TKI, and what was the response? How how did you do? How many knives did you take? What was your experience like there? Hmm. I'm not sure how many knives I took. I think you're, at that time they didn't want you to bring any more than eight knives, hmm. and so I'd have to I'd have to look it up. I brought anywhere from six to eight knives, and the response was really good. I mean, everybody liked my work, and like I said, everything sold. Um, I met a lot of a lot of nice people. I met a lot of these knife makers that I've seen online and on the forums for forever. And it's like, wow, these, these guys are real, you know, being able to go over and, you know, talk to Ken Onion. And, and, you know, like I said, Bob, Bob Terzola, it was like pretty, pretty awesome. So after that experience, did that seems like maybe that was your catapult into the, <laughs> um, the, the kind of upper stratosphere uh, with your, with your work, then, then, how did that permit you to work from then on? Was it a, did it turn into a different uh, different ball ball game for you? Different grind, so to speak. Uh, yeah, people wanted fancier stuff. 
right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. you, you bring fancy stuff to the TKI. So I started making fancier knives. And um, me and my wife went to the Blade Show just as spectators for the first time that year. And, um, you know, talked to a lot of people, met a lot of people. And um, we were at the booth where Tom Mayo and Jeremy Guinness and Matt Cucciera was. And mm -hmm. I was talking to those guys. And, and um, Matt and Jerry asked me if I wanted to share the booth with them next year. Right? And I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> this night <laughs> show thing ain't too bad, right? I can do that. So we did that booth for, for quite a few years with those guys. And, and I mean, we had a blast at that show. I mean, we'd, we'd have, we'd have big crowds. We'd do lotteries and, and, you know, me and Jerry would do it like right after another. And, and we'd have, you know, a ton of people, um, the, you know, Blade Show would get mad at us and say, we're, we're causing a fire hazard. We need to like, take it outside. <laughs> and it's like, well, what are we going to do? You know, that's why we're paying for a booth, right? right. So we can have all these people right here. Yeah. But uh, we had some good times in that booth. It was a lot of fun, even though it was three days long and, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I was so <laughs> thrilled with my experience there. Uh, this was my first time, as I mentioned to you before. And uh, part of me, I, you know, I can't believe it was my first time. I felt like I belonged there, you know, just in that sea of knives. I, you know, I could not get enough. Um, so fast forward to, you know, now. Um, in terms of how you work, what's what's your process like? Um, well, it depends on if I'm doing orders or if I'm prepping for a show. You know, if I'm prepping mm -hmm. for a show, I, I make what I want to make, what I think that is going to go good at the show. And that also depends on the show. You know, TKI, I'll bring fancier knives. Like when I was when I was working Blade Show, and I haven't done Blade Show since 2017. Mm. Um, so it's been a few years. Um, blade show, I would bring a lot more knives. You know, I might bring 20 knives to blade show and I bring a variety of, you know, a few fancy, a few mid grade, and then, you know, maybe some 50 fifties or, you know, semi production knife, you know, try and have a, a price point for, for everybody. Right. Right. Um, and then like, you know, the gathering, it's, it's more of a, a tactical folder show, I think. So, you know, the gathering in Vegas, so, I'll do a few fancy knives and then some some more frame locks because those guys all love frame locks. Even though, to me, um, I really don't care for frame lock. Right? I, to me, a frame lock is a lazy knife. Right? It's, why? It's the, why? Easy, it's the easiest knife to make. Right? <laughs> and and I think that's why so many people make them because they're they're super easy to make. Wait, wait, um, there's wait, less, wait. <laughs> less parts. Right? There's less okay. parts. Uh -huh. So uh, they're they're a lot easier to make than you know ones with bolsters and inlays and and okay. and all that. Right. Less work, less parts, but people, people love the heck out of them. But you'll, you'll notice sometimes on, on my Instagram, when I, when I show a frame lock, I'll do hashtag lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Not on everyone. And, you know, some people get it. Some people don't. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to think I'm going to ask for saying that, but, but man, it's the truth. You know, a, a frame lock is, is so much easier to make than, you know, folders with uh, bolsters and inlays and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. uh, that, the the knife at the top, Jim. If you could scroll back up to the top, thank you, sir. That one in the center at the very top. I I sort of I saw a number of um, shots of that. Yeah, uh, and I just absolutely adore that knife. Uh, what is that? Is that the Scion? It's a Scion. Yeah, it's a Scion with um, a blue twill G10, which is some old blue blue twill G10 from. Man, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not, maybe eight years ago. Um, I don't think you can get it anymore. Um, I always try and save a little bit of those materials. Mm. Um, but a lot of times that stuff goes out of favor, you know, like silver twill. A lot of people don't like silver twill. I like silver twill. So I still got silver twill and I'll make a knife every once in a while with it. And people haven't seen it for a while and they go, oh, wow, that's cool. Right. It's like that material. When was the last time you saw that material? Right. It's, it's been a long time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll pull out a little piece out of my shelf of material and go, I'm going to make a knife out of that. I haven't done that Show them. Right? Yeah. yeah. So you were talking about, you've mentioned 50-50 knives a couple of times. Is that like uh, what you call a mid-tech? You know, you have some of it made elsewhere. and Yeah. You know, the reason why I call it a 50-50 is because I figured 50% 50, 50 of it is, is machined in somebody else's shop. Okay. And, and I do the other 50% by hand, you know, hand ground blade, um, fitting, fitting the lock and the detent and, 
and um, all that. And so I, I didn't want to call it a production. The, the mid tech was getting kind of confusing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, my thing was call it a 50, 50. So. Okay. So this brings me back to my, <clears throat> my, um, my process question. Um, I was reading your webpage and you said everything is handmade from manual machines. Um, so that means exactly what, as a non knife maker, I have my own ideas about it, but what do you mean by that? That means I take material and I cut it out with a bandsaw or, or a plasma cutter. Um, even though I do use a water jet cutter on, on some of my models, I do have some parts water jet cut out now. Mm -hmm. Um, early on when, when my son still lived at home, you know, through junior high and high school, he was my bandsaw guy. Right. So he would, he would cut out my parts and drill holes and tap holes and and do all that. Well, when he went off to college, right. I kind of lost that guy. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But now I needed to make more money to pay for his college. Right. Okay. So it, it made sense to start getting stuff water jet cut out to take his place. So, you know, I, I started doing that. So a lot of my knives have water jet, you know, frames and blades, but I still do everything else and all that still has to be ground, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how it's done. Well, okay. So let me ask you <clears> this <throat> um, with, with um, the actual mechanics of it and, and getting the lock and the and the tang, you know, the lock face and the tang and everything to to fit up just right. Um, each time you make a new knife or design a new knife, um, do you have to reinvent the wheel, or do you do you come up with sort of a reci- recipe that works and and uh, and and go from there? Um, after you do it for a while, you kind of know where the detent needs to be and and, and where the stop pin needs to be, um, but it changes, you know, depending on the size of the knife. It's a, it's a lot easier to work out all that those little details on a bigger knife than it is a smaller knife. The smaller knives are harder to get all that stuff, you know, because there's less room. But uh, yeah, every time you design a knife, you can kind of use you know what you've done in the past to give you an idea of where all that stuff should line up. Um, but like I said, it's it's easier on a bigger knife. There there's just more room, you know. Yeah. So but uh, I, I draw everything up on on paper. You know, I, I don't know how to do CAD. I wish I did. I need to learn how to do CAD. So, you know, I draw everything up by hand on paper. And, um, you know, if it looks good, I'll make a copy of it. I'll put it down. Then I'll redraw it, you know, and, oh, okay, that looks good. I'll make a copy of it. And then I'll redraw it. And, and then I'll look at all, you know, three or four. And, oh, okay, well, I like this one the best, right? And then I'll, I'll take that and I'll, I'll cut the paper out or I'll make more copies of it, right? And I'll cut the paper out and I'll glue that paper on some G10 and I'll cut that out and I'll drill the holes and see if it opens and closes and, and all that stuff. And then I'll, I'll, I'll start making the knife out of real materials. I got to say, I love that. I love hearing when people um, <clears throat> do everything on paper uh, with, you know, paper and pencil. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I live in the modern world. I have a job using modern equipment and that kind of thing, but I still, um, you know, I still love my notebooks and I love my paper and I love to draw and sketch yeah. and stuff. And I love to hear that something so precise and so functional and, and beautiful, like your knives, for instance, can start from a drawing on paper and yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't have to be in the CAD world. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I took drafting in junior high, believe it or not, you know, and, and I wish they had CAD back then, <laughs> but they didn't. You know, um, or I would have learned that, and, I, and I'd be doing CAD right now. But um, yeah, hand hand drawings. You know, I'm going to learn CAD one of these days. I, I need to, um, but right now I just you know haven't had time. Okay, to what end? Do you want to learn CAD? Is that so you can? Uh, is that so you can make your designs, get them in the CAD world, and then send them out to manufacturers, or is that so you can streamline your own process in your own shop by getting a CNC or something like that? Yeah, that's that's the plan for the future. I'd, I'd love to be able to, you know, know how to program a CNC machine and uh, and do all that. To, you know, I, I'm getting old, man. I'm, I'm 61 years old, and you know, my neck's all jacked up, and my wrist and everything. You know, I'm not I'm not in the greatest shape anymore, and so you know, bending over grinding all day does not do mm-hmm. me any good. So yeah, yeah. if if I can have a CNC machine that um, that I can program to cut out some of the parts, you know, I'm still yeah. going to do the majority of the work. I'm still going to hand grind the blades, but it, it would make life easier on my hands and my wrists and my neck, you know, if 
the machine was over here doing some work, right? Seventy, because I'm not going to hire employees. You know, yeah. I, I've, I've done that before in the you know contractor world, and it's it's no fun having employees. Um, yeah, it's, um, and then you have to worry about them making your <clears throat> knives that that carry your name, right? Yeah, and, and I would imagine that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, uh, to, and I'm to, not I, I'm not trying to pump out you know hundreds of knives a month. I, I'm not really worried about that. I, I'm just I'm just having fun, you know, and, and, and making some money at the same time. You know, I, right I am so thrilled that I can make stuff that I enjoy making and somebody is willing to pay me for it. You know, I mean, that, that is the coolest thing. I, I enjoy what I do. I go down to my shop and I'm, I'm by myself. I used to be with my dog, but my dog died. <laughs> I haven't got another dog. I haven't replaced my dog yet, but you know, I, I turn on the music and I'm, I'm in my own little world day goes by and um it, it's nice and you know if it's a really nice day out and i feel like going fishing in the morning i'll take my kayak and go out fishing for a couple hours and then come back in and work in the shop for the rest of the day you know i've, I've seen those pictures that's pretty <laughs> awesome <laughs> so i mean you know it, it's, it's pretty nice you know compared to what i did in california don't get me wrong i love being a contractor mm -hmm. um i was I, I i worked all over southern california i did a lot of really cool jobs um, I could be down on the beach in Malibu one day, you know, building a custom house on the beach. Uh, I could be up in the mountains the next day, or I, I could be in the city working on a, on a school. You know, I was all over the place and, and I did that for 25 years and that was really cool. I enjoyed it, but you know, it started getting so hectic with traffic, more and more people moving there. And then, you know, the job sites changed also with, you know, you, know, you, you get the framers in. we're doing steel frame and they attach wood frame to the steel frame, right? Um, and so, you know, you'd have these guys come in and, and they're not even supposed to be on the job yet because our welding has to be visually inspected. Then after it cools down, it has to be UT, ultrasound inspected, mm -hmm. right? So these guys are burying our work in wood, right? So they're not even supposed to be on the job yet until it's inspected and signed off. And so, you know, they're running their air hose underneath us and hanging jackets on the on the, the threaded studs on our steel because it's a nice place to hang a jacket. But, you know, that's where they, they, they put the wood on. Right. And so we're, we're up in boom trucks welding above them. And, you know, our sparks go down or they catch their clothes on fire. Wow. Right. And then they get mad at us. Right. Well, you burnt my jacket. That was a forty dollar jacket. I want 40 bucks. And like, I'm not paying you 40 jackets, 40 dollars. You shouldn't have put your jacket there. Oh, you burn our air hose. You know, you got to buy us a new air hose. It's like, yeah. uh, it, it sounds a little <laughs> bit like you, you got into the game, the game. It sounds like you got into tactical knife fo uh, folders and, and such like right at the right time to, um, you know, like, the yeah, that, that was, that was very lucky that, you know, when, when I got in, it was like really when tactical knives were tactical folders were really taken off, you know? So, um, well, right, right. So at, at that point, when you first got into it, not as many fish in the sea as there are now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it seems like, yeah, you know, yeah. the knife world is a, it's a, it's a big and thriving uh, marketplace. Um, yeah. uh, what are your, how do, um, what are your impressions of how the knife world has grown or what are, what are your feelings and thoughts on, on the explosion? It seems like an explosion to me. Because um, oh, yeah. I've been following it, I've been into knives my whole life, and it just seems like now there are so many people, so many makers, and uh, you can be a maker, you know, with your hands. You can be a maker with CAD. Uh, you can be a designer. CNC machines. Yeah, you can be someone who just makes designs and sends it. To yeah. You. So oh, yeah. a lot of different uh, aspects mm -hmm. to the to the knife making world. Um, what are your feelings on how it's grown? Um, you know, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Right. I mean, I, I guess it's good. It's, it's, it's more, more variety for the collectors. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, which, which is good. It, it's harder for custom knife makers to come up with something new that isn't looking like so-and-so's knife. You know what I mean? That's, that's the, the struggle. Um, I have a lot of, a lot of designs, um, but coming up with something new that, um, doesn't, fringe on somebody else's knife is, is getting harder and harder all the time. You know, what about, um, what about infringing on your own designs? You know, <laughs> you, you, you really like you've been doing this a long time 
And, uh, you know, I meant it up front when I said, I, can, I, I feel like I can tell when I'm looking at one of your knives. And that's not because you keep redoing the same design. You certainly don't. Um, but, but like any artist who's been around long enough, you've, uh, you've uh, created a style all your own, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and it's the style that you recognize. Um, are you ever in danger of um, cannibalizing your own style? Um, probably, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you see traits like, you know, the, these look, you know, the handles look very similar, even though they're different, right? Yeah. You know, but they're, they're, they're very similar. Um, so yeah, you, you use some of the design aspects that, that, uh, you like, and that are known to you on, on some of your other knives. It's kind of hard not to, you know, cause that's yours, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? Um, so like I said, coming up with something new is, is, uh, is pretty hard. Um, you know, I come up with ideas a lot of times in the middle of the night, you know, I'll wake up and it's like, oh man, that'll be a cool knife and try and get up and, and, and draw it out and then look around and see if anybody else has done something like that, <laughs> that you're not just going, oh wow, that was a cool knife I saw and now yeah. it's not mine. <laughs> right. And, and now, oh wait, that's not mine. It's like it's like when you sit down with your guitar and you come up with the greatest Led Zeppelin riff ever. You know, oh, that's uh, they already <laughs> they already did that. They already did it. You know. So what? Um, tell me what it's been like working. Uh, you have a, a collaboration right now with Monterey Bay Knives, and you've had which looks really awesome. I mean, well, I've only seen a I've only seen just a part of it, but I, I'm trying to extrapolate outward. And then you've also done stuff with Spyderco. What's it like going from being a maker who makes almost everything by hand uh, to going to, to, to giving a design and taking it completely out of your hands with a big company like Spyderco or Monterey Bay? Um, yeah, it's, it's different. Um, Spyderco takes forever to get a knife going, right? And so a lot of times, you know, a knife that you give them, they'll, they'll put it in their case and they take it around the world, right? In that case. And if they get enough response for it, they'll make it, right? But sometimes that takes a year, right? Mm -hmm. Or two years. And so, you know, sometimes that trend that that knife was following is gone, <laughs> right? By the time right. they, they, they get around to making it. But, uh, you know, the other thing is, is, um, you know, they'll make a prototype and they'll send it to you and ask you for, you know, info. What do you think? You know, you give them what, you know, your critique, right? And sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. And once the product's out, there ain't really much you can do about it if they didn't listen, you know? So that's that's a frustration. I'm sure everybody has it working with the, the big factories. But, you know, the, the mailbox money is is nice. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the three knives that I, I designed with Spyderco, um, the Firefly, the Rubicon, and the, the Magnitude, um, you know, that money was coming in at the right time for me when my kid was in college. Uh, my youngest was in college and, uh, you know, it helped pay for his college. So I'm not going to complain about it. That uh, first Rubicon <laughs> is actually the only one that I had uh, personal experience with a friend of mine at work. I love that mm -hmm. knife. Look at the polish on that carbon. Ah, carbon. so beautiful. It feels so yeah. good in hand and it's so light. And uh, I am just an absolute sucker for a recurve and that kind of, uh, I don't know, it kind of has a barong shaped blade or, a, you know, just like that nice leaf shape. But it doesn't look like the Spyderco leaf shape. It's so, right. something different. But what is the Firefly? I'm, I'm not remembering what that was. Um, I don't have one here with me. It, it's a smaller knife. Um, this, is a, this is a really early Firefly. All right. Now, that is not an Emerson Wave. That is a bottle opener. <laughs> oh, nice. this is from this is from 2001. So the Firefly had a hole here, you okay. know, the Spyderco Firefly, and it was okay. orange and black. Okay. Um, but yeah, this this is this is old man, 2001, and it's it's beat up, and, and it's an inset lock too. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> from long ago. So uh, tell me about a little bit about your uh, what's happening with Monterey Bay knives and when that's coming out um in a few weeks the next one should be a few weeks we did um the vld um we did one in carbon fiber and then we did one in uh, this green canvas material so this next one will be the third knife um we're doing together and, and is it a different design than the vld different blade 
Yeah, different blade shape. So I guess he already showed the the thing today, so I can talk about it a little bit, right? It's it's basically this same handle, but with kind of a a, a nitro um, oh. blade shape. Oh boy, oh boy, I'm gonna have to get that one. Yeah. I love that nitro blade shape. Because not everybody likes this super pointy. You know, it's not for everybody, right? So some people like uh, you know the nitro style blade. You know better is probably more useful so when the um when the other one the vld with the with the super pointy blade when that's folded does that swedge disappear completely in the handle because of yeah. course i look at that and i think man you could sharpen that swedge and that would be pretty cool yeah. too well it, <laughs> it, if it was sharpened you'd cut yourself you'd still cut yourself so this is another knife when when my son was working with me um him and me designed this Ooh. Little firecracker, he called it the firecracker. Little fixed blade, you know, neck knife. Yeah. And uh, got, we made a ton the, of those. It's got the bottle opener again. Yeah, yeah, it's got the bottle opener. I was actually going to do a um, a deal with uh, Mass Drop, or they call Drop now. Uh -huh. And um, it actually the project got bounced because um, another knife maker um, has a patent on the bottle opener in that position on a blade really even though he patented it in um let's see i think it was 2007 and this was made in 2001 oh, and I, I think kershaw I made it kershaw made a knife years ago even before i made this one with a bottle opener in that same spot and they never patented it right because who patents a bottle opener right <laughs> I think I, I think I know is is the you don't have to say names, but is yeah. the knife is is the knife uh, a folder a smallish folder? Yeah, they make a folder and a fixed blade. Oh, okay. I, I, if you I, go on if you go on Drops website and and just uh, search carry, uh, there's a whole little write up on the whole mess. <laughs> oh, oh man, with, with some explanations on because it was going to be you know it was going to be a good little knife for for Drop and 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 me and uh, you know. Uh, that's a that's a shame. Didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So what do you have? Uh, what do you have coming up in the in the offing that you're excited about? Um, I'm working on a Tory Mini. I haven't made a Tory for a while. Tory's uh, about a three and a half, three and five eighths inch blade. So I'm I'm shrinking it down to about a three and an eighth, three and a quarter maybe. So that's that's the newest thing I'm I'm working on. Do you, um, everybody do you, seems to be wanting smaller, smaller knives these days. So that's what um, I was going to ask you. It seems like there's a real trend, uh, a downsizing trend, and maybe yeah. it's the skinny <laughs> jeans. Maybe it's all the skinny <laughs> jeans that the hipsters are wearing. Yeah. But I, I mean, I like I like the big ones. That that's kind of my, yeah. you know, where where my peccadillos rest. I like them like that. But um, uh, so uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, I the fix fix blades. <laughs> that are new or are out right now that I saw at Blade, uh, are those 50-50s? Um, the ones that look kind of like that? Yes, they look exactly like that. Yeah, well, this is a custom one, but uh, oh, those, those other ones are actually a production, full production. So and really who, So you made the design, you sent them to a manufacturer and and... Can, do you reveal who the manufacturer is of that? Um, I'm not going to because they're, they've kind of dissolved. And uh, the two guys running that shop um, don't get along. And oh, uh, that sucks. Split. So no more of those are going to be made. Ah. Yeah. So, so they were well within grasp. I know you grasp. can get some, though. You, you can get some from Capital Armory. Capital Armory. Um, Capital Armory in, um, in, right here in Texas, in Austin, Texas. Um, they bought 40 of them. And uh, if we can ever get the rest of the handles machine, they'll have 60 more. Oh, so I'm writing this down. Yeah. Capital, Capital Armory. Armory. They sell uh, suppressors and, you know, class three stuff. Very good company. Does, do you find that Texas uh, is a better environment for knife making these days or, or for the kind of things you like? Um, for like guns. Yeah. For guns, yeah. for sure. They're, but... they're way more gun friendly than than um, California. I don't, I don't think knives. It, it really matters, um, but as far as guns and hunting and shooting, 
you know, Texas is way better than California. And, you know, when I was younger, we used to be able to just go up in the foothills and set up targets and shoot. And, you know, um, you can't do that anymore. You know, they started out with um, no solid projectile zones in California, right? And so they, 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 they send out a map, right? Okay, these areas you can't shoot, you know, a solid projectile anymore. You can use a shotgun. And so every year that map got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and they pushed you farther out in the desert. Um, you know, you couldn't go up in the foothills anymore and shoot. And, you know, they kind of did the same thing with dirt bikes. I was really into dirt bikes as a kid. Um, I got a dirt bike at 13 and uh, you could not keep me off that thing. Um, we, we could ride, you know, from where I lived, I was kind of like at the edge of town. Right. And so uh, almost in the county. And um, I could, I had to push my bike down the street because my dad wouldn't let me ride it on the street. And so I pushed it down, I hit a field, and then I'd hit the orange groves. And then we'd get through the orange groves and we'd get into the vineyards. And the vineyards just went for miles and miles all the way up to the foothills. So, you know, we could ride that. We had like a hundred mile loop that we could do. And I was doing this at 13 years old, right? Wow. And, and I'd take a little fanny pack with, with uh, stuff to fix a flat tire and, and a little bottle of premix oil, right? Because we didn't have enough gas to get there and back hundred miles. And so we, we'd ride up through the vineyards and uh, there was a track, an old uh, abandoned track called reach out motocross track. We'd ride that and we'd ride up farther and we'd hit um, a Royal track, which is now Glen Helen, which is a national motocross track. Right. We used to ride that thing for free because it was abandoned also. <laughs> right? And we hit the, we'd hit the Santa Ana wash and we'd ride the wash up to, uh, and I can't remember what road it is, but the road and the rail tracks and there was a place called Joe's, uh, it was kind of like a little mom and pop store and they had burgers and stuff. We stop and get a Coke and a burger. And then we'd, we'd head up the railroad tracks up to the high desert. And of course we'd go by the nudist colony, <laughs> which was right there and hope that we could see some naked girls. Riding oh, oh, the nudist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, 13 years old kids, Man. right? Interested in all that. So we'd go by the nudist colony and take the railroad tracks up and then you could ride up to um, the summit trail, which was, in the high desert in, in Southern California. Right. And you could, the summit trail was like the most awesome trail for a dirt bike. It had some of the biggest hill climbs I've ever seen in my life. And, and then once you got tired of that, you, you go up a little bit farther and it was a gas station and the place you get sandwiches. Right. So we'd gas up, get a sandwich and then work our way back home. And it was, you know, it, it'd take, a, God, it'd take you a long time, you know, Man, that, that you just described, like, that sounds just amazing and dreamy. And it sounds like the kind of uh, day a 13 year old kid, uh, it'd be a lot harder to have that these days. Oh yeah. Sure. You, you can't really do that anymore. So yeah, it was, it was really, uh, um, man, it was a great place to, to grow up sixties and seventies. And, um, you know, like I, I think I told you before that, you know, we could be down at the beach surfing within an hour, you know, from where I lived and, in the wintertime, we could be up in the mountains, up in Big Bear, um, snow skiing. If the mm. snow was low enough, we could be in Wrightwood in a half hour, you know, from where we lived, snow skiing. So we had all this stuff within, you know, an hour's drive that, you know, different terrain, the, the, the desert, the, the mountains with pine trees and, and you know, lakes and, and then the ocean, you know, all within, within an hour. Um, it was a great place to, to grow up, especially if you were into surfing and skateboarding and you know, motorcycles and all that cool stuff. Um, well, let me, let me ask you one <laughs> last question. Um, if you could have uh, a knife made by anyone um, like handmade or whatever, by any one of the knife makers that you admire, who would it be? And what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's too hard. That's too hard <laughs> question. There's too many guys that I, that I really like, you know, and, I wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings because I want one from so many different people, you know, I, I just can't justify spending the kind of money. You know, yeah. Yeah. On, uh, on some of these customs. I, I love Michael Raymond's work. Um, Michael Raymond. Um, he's a, he's a super good guy. His work is so precise. I mean, his knives are probably as close to perfect uh, anybody's knives I've ever seen, you know, so I, I, I admire his work. Um, you know, there, there's other guys that do, you know, CNC work like, um, Dmitry Sinkovich, I think that's oh, how you yeah. say his name. I mean, that guy is a wizard with a CNC machine. I mean, everything he does is like full on custom, but it's done with a CNC machine. And, and absolutely just, beautiful too. I love yeah, his work. It, it just blows my mind. 
And then uh, Edison, Edison uh, Barajas, I think is how you say his name. Um, he's just a super cool guy and doing some really neat, neat work these days. You know, but like I said, there's a lot of guys I like, you know, I, Lee Williams work. I like the one where he's doing the, I think he calls it the Iceman, where he's got the, the, the mother of pearl in the Timascus scale that looks like ice, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, I just love that stuff. Like I said, I, I, I couldn't pick just one. <laughs> one guy yeah uh, who There's can too who, many yeah it's just always interesting to me to find out who people um who are at the man i mean you're at the pinnacle <laughs> of the custom knife making um craft and it's always interesting to me to find out who masters like yourself find to be masters so <laughs> Well, that's I why I asked. Not, to put, not to put you on the spot. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. If you're not, you'll do till the real thing gets yeah. here. Right. <laughs> no, you know, I, I do the best I can and, and, and I think I do all right, but you know, there, there's a lot of guys out there that are way better than me, you know, and, and I love looking at their work and going, hmm, I need to do better. <laughs> you know, you can always do better. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a sign of a master right there. <laughs> always. Well, you know, I mean, you that's it. I, I'm always trying to do, you know, make a better knife, make a better design, um, making something. And, and I really work to make stuff that I like, right. I'm not trying to make stuff that other people like. I, I'm trying to make stuff that really thrills me and hoping that if I like it so much, everybody else is going to like it too. Right? right. And so far it's worked out pretty good. Some designs that I've made that, I really don't care about like like the roadster, right? The roadster and the mini roadster. I don't like that knife. I designed it, I drew it up, and it's like, eh, it's all right. And I made one and I took it to the show, and everybody's like, oh, that's just that's awesome. You know, they thought it was so great. I thought it kind of sucked. Right? <laughs> so I made another one, and you notice I don't make very many, right? And it's because it, I I just don't really care for it that much. But people like it, and a lot of people have made something similar to it. Um, because people like it so much and I, I just don't make many. It's not, you know, my favorite knife. I can make the Scion and the Nitro Mini all day long and, and, and be happy just mixing up different materials. Those are two of my favorite knives to make. Well, we will keep our eye on your Instagram and watch them as you make them slowly but surely. I know you said you don't, you don't you're not looking to pump out 100 knives a month. Um, yeah. but, but part of that, taking time and taking care in making each one is part of what makes your knives special. So yeah, thank, you. thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, Peter. I really appreciate your, your time and talking about your, your knives. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Take care. It took you sir. a while to get me on here, didn't it? It did. It did, <laughs> but it worked, you know, everything yeah. has its time and, yep, and I'm, absolutely. I'm really glad it worked out. Yep. Me too. Appreciate it. Alrighty, sir. Take care. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. It's becoming maddening doing this show and uh, and meeting people like Peter because um, I've loved his knives uh, for a long time. And now having spoken with him, now I feel it's a moral imperative to at some point have one of them. Uh, great talking to Peter Carey and great to find out about uh, his evolution from welder to master knife maker. If you're interested in these kind of shows, these kind of interviews, check us out every Sunday right here on The Knife Junkie, and uh, we will have another one fresh for you. Also, we have the Wednesday supplementals. Uh, that's where I get a chance to just talk about new knives and the new knives that come through my collection. And of course, always check out Thursday Night Knives and be sure to join us, join the conversation on your phone or on your device. You can hop right on by going to the knifejunkie.com slash join and join the conversation. Uh, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying we'll see you here next time. And definitely, definitely don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.